I'm particularly honored to be interviewing you today because as many of the students know, I actually worked at Blackstone before coming to the GSB. And let's just say we were a few pay grades apart back then. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be sitting here with you and uh, having a conversation for the next 40 minutes. Good. So I want to take this opportunity and along with all of my classmates here to really get to know you more as a person, as a leader, and as someone who has great insights about the industry. And I want to walk away from it getting a few advice from you and that we can apply to our professional and personal lives. To get started, uh, I want to say that people here all know you as CEO of Blackstone, one of the largest asset management companies here. But most people might not know is you're actually an entrepreneur. I want to take us back to 1985, when you were head of merger and acquisition group at Lehman Brothers. But you decided to leave and start your own company with your co-founder, Pete Peterson. That was during a time when private equity was very new and considered a very risky asset. And you and Pete, neither of, uh, neither of you had a track record in investing. So can you talk about how did you overcome these early challenges? <laughs> well, uh, that was some time ago, but uh, immense pain keeps you in touch with that time. Uh, and uh, it, it, be, being an entrepreneur is much better uh, after you're successful than <laughs> when you're thinking about it, and let alone thinking about it, doing it. Uh, because the beginning of most things is very, very difficult, more difficult than you imagine, uh, uh, because otherwise more people would do it. Uh, and the failure rate is quite high, uh, as you know. Uh, it used to be like 9 out of 10 new enterprises fail. I'm not sure, because uh, I'm, I'm not in the academic world exactly what the number is, but it's high. Um, what, what we did is, um, after, after I sold... Um, Lehman to um, American Express Company in 1984. I stayed for a year, and then uh, Pete and I uh, left to start uh, our new business. Um, but what was interesting is I, I've, I've found that that the most important thing about a new business is is figuring out what you're doing before you're doing it. In other words, why does anybody need you? Uh, there were plenty of people in finance. Uh, when, when I was in it uh, in 1985, but you, you have to offer something that's, that's distinctive. And to do that, you have to think through what, what your strategy uh, is. And so, so Pete and I used to meet every morning for like three hours at uh, a hotel because we, we, we didn't even have an office. Um, it's like your garage concept, I guess. And, 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 you know, we'd think about what do we want to be? What do we want to do? Why should anybody, like, want to do anything with us uh, other than the fact that we were friendly and lovable, which apparently isn't enough uh, to, to, to basically prove victorious, uh, except in your own conference room, uh, meeting only with yourself, uh, and where you always win, by the way. It's uh, still... We're very successful in our own conference room. Uh, that, that what we did is we tried to say, okay, here, here, here's, I, I call this uh, a great fantasy, right? You, you have to have great fantasies in life and then realize them. So our fantasy was, what did we want to be when we grew up? Um, first, we wanted to be in the M&A business because I didn't want to raise capital. Uh, I we wanted to keep owning the whole firm. That was a cash flow business. Why not just do that? It's easy. We knew the people. We found out it wasn't easy. We didn't know the people. Uh, but th the second part was, the, at that point, the private equity business was uh, pretty much of a no-brainer. Uh, uh, prices were low. Capital was available. Weren't many people in it. Uh, that was a way of, of also raising management fees uh, at that time because you, you wanted predictable income. Don't, don't, I'm always in the risk minimization business. And the third thing, because the industry was restructuring, uh, was um, to, to basically take advantage of the fact that there were like a host of little firms to consolidate into only a few big ones. And, and 
when I joined uh, Lehman, we had 550 people. Uh, when it died, uh, it, it had around 30,000. The difference between working in a place with 500 and some odd people is you know everyone by sight. You may not know their names, you know them by sight. It's possible to have a cohesive environment. When you have 30,000 people, it doesn't feel the same. And I, I, I always like the small feeling. And uh, so, so I, I figured if I like the small pe feeling, a bunch of other people would too. And so as the firms were, were consolidating, you'd have great people you never could normally attract, but they'd be there. So the, the challenge was to figure out what these kinds of new areas is. And we called them, uh, and I'm not trying to make this uh, about Blackstone particularly, I'm just giving you a sense of how to approach an entrepreneurial situation. Uh, we, we called them affiliates and we set them up as 50-50 deals and, and we didn't know what they'd be. But we knew they needed three criteria. The first was an amazing investment opportunity so good, even a non-manager like myself could not screw it up. Uh, uh, secondly, we wanted to attract somebody to run it who was a 10 on a scale of 10. Because you'll find in your careers, if you're a 10, God bless you, you'll be wildly successful. If you attract 10s, they always make it rain if you need rain. Um, and they just have an ability to sense problems design solutions, do new things, and that's what a 10 does. A nine is great at executing, can come up with good strategies, but not great strategies. A firm full of nines, that's a winning firm. Um, eights, they, they just sort of do stuff that you tell them. And sevens and below, I don't know what they are. So, <laughs> so, 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 um, because we don't tolerate them. So, so um, it doesn't work in our industry. It may work in other industries. It doesn't work in our industry. So, so we, we, the third part of these affiliates, um, which are now folded into Blackstone, uh, uh, was, was um, to make sure they're manufacturing intellectual capital that enhances the business we, we already are in. So, because you're in the constant intellectual capital building business, forget that we're called money managers or whatever else you want to call us, that's really our business, right? And so it's just a question of waiting for one of those opportunities and then acting on it. Uh, and and that was our plan. And at the time we did it, there was no independent investment banking boutique, didn't exist, but we figured with only you know, the arrogance that you can have when you're young, that if they were doing this huge amount of merger and acquisition business with us, when we were called Lehman Brothers, why wouldn't the same two people do it when it was just some made up name like Blackstone? And we just assumed we'd be successful. By the way, that was not universally held as a belief because we'd go to the same people and they wouldn't hire us. And we said, why wouldn't you hire us? We're, we're like the same people. And we have the same knowledge base. And they said, well, we, we don't even know what you are, some little thing, why, how can we hire you? So you had to convince them that you could do the same thing you did the day before you started. Sort of odd, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine if you were like a football player and you were a Heisman Trophy winner and you just changed teams and nobody would let you play because you only could play with the other uniform? Uh, just doesn't make sense. But that was the world, uh, so, so, so that worked. Uh, and we finally managed to convince the people and we started all these businesses and now we're the biggest in the world at what we do because and we're still fi uh, following the same basic uh, plan. But one thing, just as an entrepreneurial, you must be crazy thing. Um, when we did our first private equity fund, we sent out 488 um, offering circulars to people we knew. I, we ended up with 32 investors and they all didn't come at the beginning. So I don't know how often you like to be rejected, but try it that many times. My math skills aren't that good, but it's gotta be somewhere around 350 something, 450 something rejections. People who look at you and you have a meeting where they consider you, 
And I don't know if any of you remember the movie Gladiator, but the emperor sits there and he goes, <laughs> and it's about you. It's, it's not a product, it's you. You're a loser. And how many times can you be told you're a loser? The answer apparently is almost infinite. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and so anybody who's been through a process like that ends up as a much nicer, more humble person, no matter where you started, because the world is telling you, you are a loser. And um, we ended up raising the biggest first time fund in history with two people who'd never made an investment just by force of will. So it does show you that force of will counts. It counts. And, and you, you'd be amazed at the number of people who reject you who are completely dishonest. One of my favorite ones, and I, my, <laughs> I have many favorite ones, but one of my favorite ones was the head of one of the biggest banks in the world uh, who we'd saved on some disaster uh, by restructuring it, and, and it was a very difficult situation for them. Anyhow, we thought they'd be nice and throw us $10 million, which is the time was a, a lot of money. And you know, we had a meeting with him. He's a famous guy. You know, you'd invite him out here. Maybe he was here. Uh, and he, he said to us, you know, you're, you're really good people. We'd give you money, but um, we, we just don't do this type of investing. We're, we're a bank. We don't, we don't do this. So, you know, sometimes you're defeated by structure. Uh, and we sort of slunked out of his office. And, and he, for some reason, this man forgot that my partner's wife was on his board of directors. I, I don't know exactly how he forgot that. And she told us that, in fact, they were regularly approving these types of investments. You save the person, you save their job, the guy just lies to you. It's stunning. It's really stunning. So for all of you people out there who want to be entrepreneurs, you got to have a thick skin. You, you, you almost need s some friendly psychologist training, tra tra traipsing around with you to buck you up from all the setbacks that you have. It's always great after your Jack Ma uh, but it's not so great, you know, if you file a chapter. Um, and, and the difference in that, you know, Jack's a 10. He almost did go down uh, several times. Uh, it's that scrambling ability, the ability to take that kind of abuse and rejection and believe in your basic plan, but be adaptable and just keep going. It's, it's really... Uh, Difficult, as you can see, it's uh, you know that was quite some time ago. It's 29 years ago. It's still a searing experience, and now you know we have this wonderful business with people like this. And you know, I couldn't even get hired at our firm now. I'm not smart enough, uh, but and it's 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 fantastic. We turn out these great results year after year after year, and it's easy now. But these early years where you'll find that your own capabilities, which you think are remarkable, are, are, are perhaps not exactly suited for purpose. And you have to hire someone else, you have to do something else. You, you, you never sleep because of the fear of failure. And if you don't have that fear, you'll stay asleep, you will fail. Uh, you know, because it takes these kind of remarkable human effort uh, to overcome a world that isn't as anxious for you as you are for it. Uh, and if you know, it's good that you have to be fundamentally delusional to get out there on the field of battle and make it happen. Uh, and we invent new things all the time. I love it. Uh, that's what I spend. I spend a lot of time doing a lot of things, but in terms of stuff that I really enjoy is starting new things and bringing them into reality. and. You know, the idea I'm running a, a really consequential big company of some type uh, is a bit of a mystery because I think it's all just a startup. And, and one of the other things 
is if you lose that sense that, that things have to be done right, that other organizations, people, and so forth are, are trying to uh, you know, sort of succeed at, at your expense, then your organization becomes vulnerable, you become sloppy, you become self-confident, and you can never, ever uh, let that happen. And there are examples that you study all the time. I mean, that's why I, th I think business schools exist, is to look at these sort of train wrecks of companies that used to be great that stopped being great, lost their, their um, vision, wandered around, became self-confident, and people came to work believing that things would be fine the next day because they always have it. It's, it, it's not necessarily like that. Uh, you know, somebody's always innovating. Somebody's always trying to do better. And if it's your expense, then you're just a, you're just a victim. And, and your jobs are not to be victims. It's to have someone else be a victim. That was very inspiring, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. At least I've, my takeaway from that was if I walk out and face rejections, I'll know Steve had faced more. <laughs> Um, all, all jokes aside, um, we actually want to now move forward, and as you mentioned, right. the 29 years you've built Blackstone, and you've really built it into a diversified platform with many distinct business lines and alternative investment. So a lot of people think it's actually very difficult to be a founder and a CEO, and uh, Mike, because it actually takes different traits to do both, but you've clearly succeeded in doing both. So. My question to you is, do you agree with that statement? And if so, how did you make that transition? I, I agree completely. It, it, it's, these are different kind of skills. Um, somebody once said to me that no, no one was born as a CEO. There's not a CEO gene. It's a trained behavior, uh, not a necessarily an intuitive one. And, um, you know, being an entrepreneur is uh, a, a different set of skills. I, I've learned a lot, and I've, I've done this now for 29 years, so there's a lot of evolution. I made a, a whole bunch of mistakes earlier uh, in uh, our business's history because I, I actually didn't really know what to do. It's, um, uh, and I got a little coaching from my partner, uh, who had been a CEO uh, twice before. Um, but there's a whole skill set of learning to be um, a CEO. First of all, I mean, I'm sure you have classes that teach this. But uh, when it's done live, uh, it's, um, it's, it's different. Uh, one of the things that, 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 is, that you have to recognize when you're CEO is people listen to you uh, way more and they, than you'd think, and, and they amplify. Uh, everything that you say. And, and so you have to be exceptionally careful about what you say. Um, e even just sort of a joke can get misinterpreted. Um, uh, people look for, uh, you know, your, 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 your approbation, uh, your praise. You, you can't give it uh, unless it's deserved, but, but if it's deserved, you have to be really generous doing that because, because people respond to it and it's important. Um, uh, you have to realize that uh, human beings um, are not like parts of a deal. Uh, you know, in a deal, it's a pretty much of a closed system. Uh, what one person gets, the other one loses, and that's the way it is. Uh, with an ongoing team of really terrific people, um, you, you can't manage that way. You, sometimes um, you see a problem and you have to game it out. If, if, if people were just like, like chess pieces, you know, you just sort of move them and, and it's over, but they're not. And, you know, sometimes you can see a problem and, and you have to uh, strategize it out. So, so if you're moving people around, you don't want anybody particularly to lose confidence in themselves, you want to be nice to everybody, but you want to accomplish the objective. So sometimes it could take two years to do something that you know should happen in 10 minutes. 
But if you did it, uh, then you'd break so much glass through the organization that you'd threaten the institution or you'd threaten core people, and there's a way to work that out. So, so time, actually, uh, you know, as opposed to some, some cartoon-like uh, uh, squash-buckling uh, CEO, uh, it doesn't work that way. You, you have to be careful with every move. You have to give people dignity, uh, but you have to accomplish your objective. So time is something that you give up sometimes uh, to do that. Uh, and you, you also have to uh, articulate the core values of your business. Uh, and you can never stop doing that. And you can never stop doing that enough. Everybody has to know what you stand for. And they have to see you a lot as a CEO. Because that way, organizations don't lose their soul. On the other hand, you have to surround yourself with phenomenal people who share that value system. And there's a very interesting... Um, uh, almost internal debate you have to go through between control and seating control. Because nobody wants to work at a place if they're brilliant, terrific people uh, like we have, if they're so tightly controlled, they don't, they don't feel they have any autonomy or, or, or dignity. And there may be an issue in finance, not some other industries. Uh, so, so you have to develop controls so that nobody can blow up the, the firm but autonomy enough uh, so that everybody thinks uh, that, that they have self-worth uh, and importance and can utilize their, their gifts. Uh, it is very useful as a CEO to have plans to expand your business, not for earnings per share reasons, interestingly. It's so everybody in the organization can grow up and not be forced out. So you start new businesses because most people in an audience of the type that I'm uh, speaking uh, to, uh, don't want to be subordinated work units. That's what they called them in the 1980s. You all want to be at least brigadier generals, if, if not more. You, you don't want to be like a private or a corporal. You want to be in charge of your destiny. You're not so unusual. Most people would like to have ownership of their own growth. So, so part of being a CEO is figuring out how can you provide that for everybody. And one way to do that is to start new businesses where people can move up and, and exercise you know, their creative abilities uh, you know, so that uh, you know, a, a firm is continually entrepreneurial. Uh, so so it, it was a big uh, step for me to slow down because I was like a deal person, and that's a different world, and, and, and just learn how to do that. And it's, it's a transition, and you make mistakes while you're doing that. Um, but after you've done it for a long time, I, I actually have fun with like people who are newly appointed CEOs. They'll, they'll call me up and say, can I have lunch with you? Can you tell me how to do this job? And because they don't know, and the smart ones know they don't know, and, and, you know, so none of us know everything, but they're, they're like help, helpful hints uh, as to how to do that. Thank you, Steve. I want to switch gears a little bit and um, talk about your leadership, because View from the Top, as you know, is a series of leadership. Uh, we want to know, what was your personal leadership philosophy that led you to lead Blackstone over the past 29 years? No, I, I've always been a leader. You know, I was like one of those student Apologies. council, choose your high school people, and you know, uh, uh, you know, president of your high school people, and did stuff in college like that, did stuff in business school like that. So, I don't, I don't know how I got that way. Um, I've, I've always been like that. I've, I've always enjoyed being in charge of things and doing new things. And, and um, I remember I brought a rock group that was, that was famous at the time to my high school. And everybody said it couldn't be done. 
I thought it would be fun uh, and, you know, sort of interesting. So I like doing new things, and I like being a leader, and I like dealing with um, complexity, and I, I like dealing with problems. I like creating, uh, and, and usually that's the best spot uh, to be in. So here we have a course at the GSV. Uh, it's called Touchy Feely. Uh, it, uh, many of you might have taken it here. Basically, it's about how to be a leader by being more aware of your emotional reactions and building deeper connections with people through self-disclosure, vulnerability, and really showing your authentic emotions. So we're actually trying to figure that out is how do we apply that in our leadership style and especially in a workplace? So what's your take on this touchy-feely kind of leadership style? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I went to a different business school. <laughs> uh, this course, potentially, at least when I went, could have been antithetical to everything that people believe. Uh, and, and that was, that was pretty rough. Uh, uh, but I understand where you're coming from. Um, I, 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 I think Thank it's... Thank you for your understanding. Yeah. <laughs> do, do we have a therapist in the group here? <laughs> to, to step up. Uh, the, um, I, I, th I think it's important, uh, as I was saying before, to treat people in a way where they feel secure, where, where they feel valued, um, where they, they feel that you must tell the truth. Uh, and um, there are different ways of, of doing that. Uh, but in our investment process, for example, we, 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 I was going to say something like we encourage that people come forward with different points of view. In fact, we demand it. Uh, it's not encouraging. And, and that's because uh, I did a I proved a terrible investment as the second investment we did, and we lost money, and it was incredibly devastating to me uh, because um, uh, as long as you're talking about emotions, I, I had some investor who wanted to see us, and he started screaming at me. Uh, I had never been screamed at before, and nobody in my house had ever raised their voice. And here's this person screaming for about, felt like an hour, it was five minutes, completely out of control. And I mean, I, I was, um, I, I almost wanted to cry, uh, actually, because he was right. I, I had made a, 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 the wrong decision. And that's because we didn't have as organized an investment process because we were new. So the so best thing we did, retrospectively, although it was gruesome, uh, was, was to lose that money because we set up a process where everybody uh, in at the firm at that time, if it was just private equity, now we were doing a lot more things. We had to go around the table and everyone had to express themselves. And they had to do it with something negative about the proposed investment, risks that people didn't see. And so we got used to, uh, if you brought an investment, you knew you, you weren't gonna get universal approbation. The job of everyone around the table was to critique it so that we, we, we got rid of the risk or understood it. And At the GSB, we call that giving feedback. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's giving feedback that gets people angry. That's the problem, right? <laughs> so so, so you, you have to set up an environment where people feel secure that that, that act of criticism is not personal. It's impersonal. It has nothing to do with you bringing the deal. It has nothing to do with them pointing out the shortfalls in the deal, because every deal will be treated exactly the same, and every person will have that same role. So what we tried to do uh, as part of an overall, I don't know whether it's touchy-feely or, or uh, you know, it's, it's more in institutional, um, comfort for individuals is to have that direct conversation in a way that ma made it non-personal. And so, so the concept of worrying about these things, which is, I think, what you're actually asking, is, 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 is really important to have an ongoing 
um, uh, successful business, but to have the people in it always feel protected. Uh, and, and we set up processes like that. And, and you know, we have, uh, we have very, very, very low turnover at, at our firm. And, and I guess the last two or three years, we were voted like the best place to work uh, in finance um, by pension and investment age and some other stuff and so forth. So care to these issues is, is really important. You mentioned uh, not, not keeping those criticism personal, but I actually want to get a little bit more personal with you, which is I want to learn more about your personal background and motivations. So when you were first graduating from HBS, what motivated you back then? And now, now what motivates you now? And how has that changed over the years? Well, there are a few answers to that. When I, I remember interviewing at, <laughs> um, it's a shame this is video. Um, I, that, 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 that um, when, when I was graduating from college, um, I was interviewing with, with some employer, and they, they said, what, what did you want to be? Um, why do you want to work here? I, and I said, well, I, I, I want to be a telephone switchboard. And the person looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, I want to have all these inputs running up my arm, going in my head, twist them around, and shoot them out some other place. That's what I want to do as a process. And the guy looked at me and said, you're wrong for us. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, but but uh, when, when, by the time I was a little more, uh, you know, sort of developed, uh, graduating from business school, I, I still wanted to do the same thing. It's a insatiable need to learn what's going on and see something n new and and do something as a result of that. And uh, that's that's never really stopped now. That, that expresses itself in, in different ways. I also wanted to make a lot of money. I guess you're not allowed to say that anymore because that's unfashionable or you only have to do it through capital gains with new apps. But, but <laughs> ba ba back in the olden days, you, you sort of did it you know, with more current income. Uh, and so I, 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 I had, I had uh, $1,400 when I graduated uh, from, um, uh, from money that somebody, a group of people, gave me on my bar mitzvah. I didn't even know my parents had held it aside, and I, I, I was getting married, so I saw this wonderful ring at Tiffany's for 1300 So I sort of looked at it. I said, don't you have something a little better? I might as well blow the whole thing. So I spent 1400 I started at zero. So <laughs> I, I, I decided I, I, I needed fuel. Uh, so that was one of my objectives. But the, the, the basic objective was, was to put yourself in situations where the, the learning curve was so steep and, and the outcomes were so consequential that it just was going to be f really fascinating and interesting and fun. And I'm still doing that. And I love it. Uh, it's great. I, it's, uh, um, yesterday I had uh, Henry Kissinger come over. Uh, he was doing a video for uh, the Schwarzman Scholars, and uh, it's nice of Henry to do that. He's, he's on our uh, advisory board, and we were walking uh, down the hall after he'd done this video, and, and you know, he said something like, geez, Steve, you know, I'm like 91 and a half. I still feel like I'm in my 30s. And, and uh, I, he, said, he said, I think you're the same. I said, yeah, except I'm not 91 and a half, but, <laughs> but, but, but I you know, feel exactly the same way. And he said, you'd, you'd never retire, would you? And I, I said, well, why would I retire? My life's so interesting. And I'm learning all the time, and I'm traveling all over the world, and it's great. It's fantastic. And he said, yes. He said, I do uh, what, what I do for, for, for no compensation. And, I said, yeah, I, I, I get it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's as you'll find, because they're mostly young people in the audience, that um, when you find something you love and, and you're good at it and you, know, you go to your touchy-feely course and you're self-actualized, 
right? I mean, that's, that's what it's like. That's the game. It's, it's, not, it's not about money. It's about creation. It's, it's about feeling of, you know, you're totally alive every day and it's interesting and you run into heads of state or, or finance ministers in my kind of industry or, or unique transactions or doing things that are the biggest in the world with great returns and doing unusual things. You're always out on a frontier. This type of life is completely seductive and, and it's, it's not age determined. Uh, it's really, um, it, it, it's really about you. Uh, and I remember when I was interviewing um, for a job in, um, I was graduating from business school and uh, I went to some firm and you, know, you meet a lot of people when you're interviewing, it's very interesting. And I was sitting in front of a guy who looked like he was in his 80s uh, named, uh, uh, his name was Clifford Michelle, and he, he had all these bound volumes of financings and things he'd done. And the guy had these brilliant blue eyes, and he was sitting alertly, and he's in his 80s. And the guy was amazing. And I said, you know what? I want to be him. I want to be somebody at that age who can do what he's doing, because he's completely engaged uh, with life. You can do that, and that's the fun of it, and that's what I wanted to do, and you know, I was lucky uh, to be in an industry that was going through enormous expansion at the time when I was a young person. And so I was lucky, and I didn't blow myself up. That was good too, boy. And, and um, I have one saying, and to those of you who are interested in finance, there's apparently like 12 people in your whole school now, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, uh, there, there, there are no brave old people in finance. They usually get blown up by the time they're 40, and if they're given authority by the time they're 45, uh, because you always have to have balanced risk, you always have to worry uh, about your downside. Um, if, if I could say just one thing, uh, this little commercial for Schwarzman Scholars uh, uh, program, this is like really a wonderful thing we're doing. It's like the roads, uh, except you get to go to Chenhua University, where we have a distinguished graduate, uh, and, um, uh, and, and um, it's going to be a marvelous introduction to China for a one-year uh, program, uh, where you know be taught in English. Um, which is a universal language. And you know you have three different majors, uh, but we're gonna start out with a core course is everything about China and have a leadership course uh, designed by the other business school um, where they have cold weather uh, on the other side uh, of the country. Uh, and then you'll have course in your major, everybody will get a mentor uh, from the real world, some of the people I haven't disclosed yet. I mean, they're some of the most famous people in the world. Um, uh, and um, you, you, you get to take trips uh, around China. Uh, you'll meet the leaders of the country. Uh, and, and then we'll have a steady flow of really fascinating people who come to Beijing We're doing this in a, um, a, a new building that we built that looks like a college at Oxford or Cambridge, except it looks like a Chinese building but the same thing, residential college. And uh, we're having some meeting, Rob, I think, uh, later today, you know, where, where I guess people are allowed to come. So, so where is this mystery meeting? Okay, so I got my commercial in, which I wasn't <laughs> supposed to do, but then again, I'm an entrepreneur. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for answering all the questions with such tremendous candor. Really appreciate it. Um, at this point, I'm going to have everyone here in the audience have the opportunity to ask Steve any questions you want. There are two mics going around the auditorium, Ryan on the left, Carolyn on the right. We're also taking questions from Twitter, especially if you're sitting up there. We don't have mics there, so please tweet your questions to GSBVFTT. Um, I'll start with a question from Twitter. Sure. Um, so this is a question that came in through Twitter. Um, as you grew Blackstone, um, how did you ensure you got the right people for the right seats? 
to the right people? For the right seats at Blackstone. How did, uh, hiring is a wonderful exercise. Um, it's really fun. Uh, and um, what you're trying to do is, is match people's capability with, with who they really are. One thing we're doing this Schwarzman Scholars Program is trying to, do, to figure out who will be great future leaders and, and then give them uh, a year to learn about China. And, and people say, you know, how, how do you know who's going to be good? Uh, and um, you have to talk to them. It, it's not a resume. A resume is like a, a building block. Are they smart or are they dumb? If, if they're dumb, you don't see them. Uh, but, but smart people come in much different versions. And, and um, you know, when, when, when people like myself meet other people, I, I, I don't know how to interview uh, anybody. They, they walk in to your room and they sit down and you look at them and somebody says something or they have something on their resume that's interesting. This is, you know, like the somebody who's won the world chess championship and still runs the 400 meters in less than four minutes. And you go, when do you spend time to do all this stuff? And you start a conversation and what you're trying to do is figure out how flexible their minds are, uh, how emotionally stable they are, how will they do under stress? Are they self-reliant? Um, uh, what, what's their ability to express themselves? Uh, sometimes you can see fear in people's eyes. This is usually not a good thing, right? Fear, I mean like complete fear. What are they doing sitting there? I'm, I'm sort of easy. They shouldn't be scared of me. If they're scared of me, they're going to be scared of somebody else. And, and that's not good, at least from a sales perspective, you know, being scared. So there are all kinds of things that people will tell you. And you're trying to burrow into their head and predict future behavior. And, and if you can do that uh, and, and you have certain criteria that they have to be nice, we don't, we don't hire anybody that's not nice or anybody that's political. That's what happens because there are a bunch of, there's entrepreneur stuff in the air here. So you don't have to hire anybody who's disagreeable just because they want to be hired. You don't have to do that. So you can make whatever culture you want to make. It's hard at the beginning because not everybody wants to join you because you're not successful, so you're desperate, right? But you'll find that you don't do well unless you're hiring people who are consistent with your values. So you've got to know yourself and you've got to stick to those kind of people. Meritocracy, good thing. You know, sort of being able to operate horizontally instead of being, you know, sort of a controlled monster. We can't do those. You can't have those people around. Even if they're smart, even if I see movies with people who are like that and smart, it's, it doesn't work well uh, as you get more mature. You can have exceptions, but basically um, you, you, you have to have people who you think can really adapt, really have a gift, really are nice, really can communicate, um, and you have to imagine them under big stress. How will they behave? Will they be honest? Things like that. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Right there. Uh, so when you were first starting your business, all, all entrepreneurs have to sort of uh, overcome an established order. In your case, you mentioned that you had a great team wearing a brand new jersey, and you found it hard to get people to, to deal with you, so to speak. Um, what motivates that sort of conservatism? How did you overcome that? And, and how did you sort of build Blackstone into today's establishment? Um, finishing the last answer, one other thing, as you're hiring people, uh, that people over 40 are their reputation. Below that, they change, they adapt. When they're over 40, if you're interviewing somebody and you think they're a good person, but like five people tell you they're really not, don't believe yourself. 
believe the five people who've had experiences with them. Don't let your own perception, somebody who's really a set personality, uh, overrule the other stuff. Every time I did it, I was wrong. Uh, so I've learned some lessons. The question about the world uh, not accepting new things and how do you change it, um, I, I, I've, I've learned uh, that other than at Stanford and you know this part of California, um, people basically don't like change. As distressing as it is to imagine that, they don't like change. Every time we've tried to change something, for example, we renovate, we were renovating a, um, a hotel in London that was called Claridge's and it was very prominent. And um, we bought it in 1995 and it was quite run down and it needed to be, uh, you know, sort of um, modernized in a variety of ways. I mean, I got these endless barrage of things. Don't change it, right? Don't change it. It's, it's so wonderful. Don't change a stick of furniture, even though you were sitting in a couch and your knees were over your eyes, right? <laughs> Don't change anything. And, you know, you get sort of like protests and so forth. Oh, so we changed things. But, but we, we didn't change them bad. We changed them good. And I had one particular person who was born there during World War II who, you know, really became very um, unhappy. And so, so, you know, we did the change with English heritage. Everything was like beautifully done. And at the end of that, um, he wrote me this long letter saying um, uh, how wrong he was and, and how obnoxious he was. And this is a famous person. And it's absolutely wonderful. And I just wanted to tell you I was completely wrong. You usually don't get that satisfaction. Um, but, but change is really hard for a lot of people. And, and so you have to recognize that whenever you start something new and you go out of your way to make them comfortable um, because you can introduce them to change. Uh, at, 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 at Blackstone, uh, it's not directly applicable. We keep doing new things. And as long as you, you really do good returns uh, and people know that you care about them, the investors, and you'll never do anything to hurt them, and you're on their team, on their side, and you're, you're just like trying to make their lives better, they have to understand your motives. And if you can explain your motives, and your motives are direct and pure, really, I mean, we want to make money, but we, we, we only want to do this for the benefit of people we're investing for. And if they, never, if they understand that you never will introduce a product that, that is not terrific, you believe completely in it, that's your business, then what happens is they start trusting you, and they should. And that's building up, in effect, brand equity. Steve, I wish we had more time with you, but I've saved actually a last question that I want to ask you. And it has become a V from the top tradition. And it's a question we all had to answer when we apply to the GSB, which is, what matters most to you and why? You all answered this? <laughs> and they, they all answered it very well to be sitting here today. <laughs> Um, what, what, what matters uh, to, to me most is excellence uh, and delivering sort of a vision into reality. It could be commercial. It, it could be, uh, you know, in the art business. It, it could be um, imagining uh, something that's... Uh, uh, never been done or beautiful, and making that happen. Uh, that's, that's what I really love doing. And, you know, sitting in a, in a room that's perfectly beautiful from every angle, that, that gives me pleasure. Having investments that are fantastic and work out right, that gives me pleasure. Um, 
a perfectly hit tennis ball against a great player so they can't get it and they're better than you. That gives me pleasure. All of these types of visualizations where you're executing perfectly give me pleasure. So, you know, what was that? So it's a psychology course where they had the bird that kept hitting something to get you know, they put some electrode in its brain and it would hit the bar to keep getting, you know, stimulated with the, um, with the pleasure. Uh, I, I do that, except I'm not a bird and I don't have that. But, but basically, you know, people like that. And, and there are a lot of different ways where you can create that scenario. And, and I, 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 I love a perfect sunset. I love these just wonderful things that they all line up and they're, they're just excellent, excellent. So that's what I like. Maybe I wouldn't be admitted here. But just. Well, well, to the pursuit of excellence, and thank you for your time here with us. Thank you.